I'm Nancy Florine, an at-large member of the Montgomery County Council, inviting you to a tour of my hometown, Garrett Park. That's coming up on the next edition of Paths to the Present. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Paths to the Present. I'm your host, Gail Street. Groups dedicated to preserving the county's past are always on the lookout for ways to help residents discover our common heritage. Today's show focuses on two new efforts bringing Montgomery County's history to life. First, we'll look at Montgomery Connections, a multifaceted project designed to reach non-traditional audiences in innovative ways. Then, we'll follow an architectural walking tour developed by the citizens of Garrett Park. But before we get started, let's do the history quiz. This iron tool dates to the 1800s and was used to complete a task that few folks do for themselves anymore. A hand-operated crank lowers the shaft and the entire device can be screwed to a table. Think you know what it is? Stay tuned. I'll give you the answer at the end of the show. In July, the Montgomery County Historical Society launched an ambitious multilingual project called Montgomery Connections. It's designed to bring our ancestors' stories out of museums and archives closer to where we live, work, and play, and in languages more can understand. There's a new way to learn about history in town. It's in public buildings, bus shelters, and in our newspapers, all with the hope of engaging diverse audiences in local history. Debbie Rankin, Executive Director for the Montgomery County Historical Society, explains. So the goal of the project is to reach out into the community um, to audiences that historical societies don't usually engage. The project is called Montgomery Connections. It is offered in three languages, in English, Chinese, and Spanish, using different types of media. The foundation of the project is a set of freestanding banners designed to move throughout the county in a cluster. Each one focuses on a different theme from our county's past and presents the information in three different languages. Not a lot is revealed on the banner itself. It's hoped that those who see it will take the next step to learn more. The banners encourage people to call a phone number to hear audio, which is recorded content about the particular theme done in first person. Hello, I'm Fred Van Hosen, and I'm the first extension agent for Montgomery County. The job I started in 1970. And different phone numbers access the three languages. Hola, soy Fred Van Hosen, y soy el primer agente de extensión para el condado de Montgomery. We also have website support as well, so you can go to the website and get even more information and also hear the audio from there as well. Fred Van Housen. Topics were selected with the help of focus groups from the different communities. So far, four themes have been developed. They are Yarrow Mammoth and Slavery in Montgomery County, uh, Blanche Corwin and the Great Depression, um, Dora and John Higgins and their story of the Civil War raid in Rockville, and Fred Van Hosen and the story about agriculture in the community. Funding for the project came from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. The grant funds 12 themes, so we, this is four, we ha we'll have eight more. We'll, we hope to launch the next four in the winter of 2009, then we'll go into development of the final four themes. And the, the thinking is that this will be a, a long-term project, that just when, when the grant funding is over, that this will be a project that we can continue to keep alive and interesting to the community. The banners premiered in the city of Rockville. In August, they moved to Silver Spring. In the fall, they'll continue to other county locations. You can follow their progress in a lot of ways, on the internet, in Facebook, and through Twitter. To get started, go to www.montgomeryhistory.org, click on the Montgomery Connections link, and make some connections to this county's past.
Now let's move from a high-tech outreach effort to a relatively low-tech one. Thanks to a grant from the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission, the town of Garrett Park was able to publish a brochure that leads visitors on a tour of that town's historic district. You can get a copy of the brochure by calling the town office at 301-933-7488. And I guarantee you'll want one after seeing this next segment. Nestled next to the train tracks between Rock Creek Park and Route 355, Garrett Park today sits on 500 acres and features nearly 350 homes. The town got its start as a railroad suburb when the Metropolitan Branch of the B&O opened a stop here in 1873. Soon after, residents were drawn to the cooler countryside while the train offered easy access to the city. Garrett Park has grown over the years, but its small town charm endures thanks to the history that's been preserved. Perry Chapman has lived here since 1993 and is a member of the town's preservation committee. The vision for Garrett Park was that it would be an ideal suburban town outside of Washington accessible by the train which had recently been built and which still runs to the town. Um, the town originally was a huge tract of land that stretched quite a ways to Beers Mill Road. It's now smaller, but the part that was planned out that exists today was planned in 1887. This was the only commercial in building in Garrett Park. It was the general store uh, and post office originally. The storekeeper lived on one side of the building. Um, and where the main room of the restaurant is today was the general store. Over the years, it's remained the town's commercial center. Uh, it was renovated in 2002, and so it now houses a restaurant. The post office is downstairs, and the mayor's office and town offices are on the top floor. The tour starts from here, and across the street is the smallest house in town. It was built in 1923 to house the post office, and then in 1928 became a house. Walking up the hill along Waverly Avenue, you immediately notice a mixture of architectural styles. This tour travels past many of the original Victorian homes, but you'll also see styles from other eras. Almost 40 Victorian homes were built in the first 20 years of Garrett Park. They were set on large lots with room for gardens. Back then, some Garrett Parkers kept chickens and cows. Later, newer houses filled in the spaces in between. There really are houses from every single decade in town. This variety, as well as the preservation of open space, is what makes Garrett Park so special. This Victorian dates to 1890 and features one of the finest remaining carriage houses in town. Directly across the street is the Sprig House. The Sprigs were infamous in about 1891 or two for wanting to have indoor plumbing. Indoor plumbing necessitated having a cesspool and at the time it was thought that that would bring malaria or cholera and terrible disease. So the town uh, at this point incorporated uh, and the first regulation passed was to ban cesspools in town. And next door to the Sprig House is one of the largest, most elaborate Victorian houses in town. It's got a beautiful turret, enormous porch, uh, and its plan though has actually been found in one of these pattern books, that were books where you could buy already existing architectural plans. When Garrett Park first began, a lot of people were drawn to come here in the summer. Uh, this house, which we call Rose Villa, originally rented out rooms to summer boarders, and it was apparently a social center for people in town. Across the street from Rose Hill are houses that began as small bungalows in the 1920s and 30s. Most have been expanded over the years, and many have retained that unique bungalow style. From here, you could cross Strathmore Avenue to the village part of the town, 
here is what is now the town hall, although it was originally a church. And if you go all the way to the end of the street, you come to what was the original one-room schoolhouse for Garrett Park. Let's continue along Strathmore Avenue. Originally, this was called the County Road, and it connected Garrett Park with Rockville Pike. This home is a sneak peek of a style we'll see more of in a moment. As you can see, Strathmore Avenue has become a very busy thoroughfare. The recently added street lights, curbs, and crosswalks are an attempt to calm the growing volume of traffic. Turning onto Montrose Avenue, we approach a set of charming houses that were sold in a unique way. These post-World War I houses are known as Chevy houses. They're called that because when you purchased one, you could get a loan for a brand new Chevrolet thrown in with it. They were very small. The first few had only one bedroom. Later homes had two and three bedrooms. But they were so small that they came with fold-down Murphy beds and built-in eating booths, which functioned as the dining room. As you can see, most have been extensively altered over the years. Continuing along Montrose, the diversity of architecture is again very apparent. Contrast this 1891 Victorian with this four square that was built in 1908. This home, along with its neighbor, replaced original Victorians after a fire destroyed them. Since 1977, Garrett Park has been an arboretum, which I don't think that many towns are arboretums, but an arboretum is a collection of plants that are cared for and actually records are kept of them. And it's usually for a specific purpose. In this case, it's to bring a greater variety of species into the town. And it's one of the things that makes Garrett Park such a wonderful place to live. The tour ends with a walk through Porcupine Woods. Porcupine Woods was actually on the original plan for Garrett Park. It was supposed to have fountains and lakes and things like that that are definitely not here. Um, and it for years apparently belonged to somebody else. But the town uh, arranged to purchase it in the 1960s and now it is a very small woods. It's maybe a block long. But I have to say, when I walk my dogs through there, I have this little moment of feeling like I'm someplace else. The tour ends here, back where we began at Garrett Park's one commercial building, but now we're in front of the post office. The post office is something that also makes Garrett Park very special because Everybody in town, or at least almost everybody in town, has a mailbox, and we, we don't have mail delivery to our houses. So the post office is really the social and civic center of town that makes it seem like you're living in a small town in the country, even though we can walk to Bloomingdale's should we feel the need. Okay, time's up. Did you figure out the history quiz? County resident Henry Griffith II used this bottle capper to seal beverages for storage. Liquid was poured into a bottle like this. A cap was placed on top. The bottle was then sealed with the turn of this crank. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. If you have comments for us or ideas for future shows, send an email to paths.present at verizon.net. Be sure to tune in again next time as we trace more paths to the present. See you then.